Hey, hey, Steve. What do you think about Derek White's hairline and Charles Barkley absolutely assassinating him over it? He looks worse than Stephen A. Smith. No, I haven't really seen it. I don't really pay attention to Derek White's hairline. So, <laughs> hey, uh, I sent you a video last night of Kobe Bean Bryant hitting a left hand shot, dropping the mic at a workout for the Clippers in 1996. Would have put Kobe at 17 years old, light years away, light years ahead of Michael Jordan. Uh, by the way, at 17 years old, have you ever let that sink in, Big Steve? I mean, against air. <laughs> I mean, uh, a lot of fighters look good on the mix. Speaking of against air, Steve, I've seen videos of Trey Lance, um, Will Levis, AR-15, they call him, look up absolutely fucking atrocious. They can't hit a bag. Wait, I thought AR-15 was looking like a tan John Elway. Wasn't that the report like last week? Yeah, AR, a- 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 he balling out right now. And I think it's AR-5. I think he ran number five, yeah. Jerry, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he had the gun control. He, he, he did a 360 dunk on a basketball court. He's balling out in the in NFL. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. He's making good throws. I follow all the coach pages. You know me, JB. He's been slanging that thing. The footwork's looking good in the pocket. The hey, man's Steve, locked what in. can we bet, Steve? What can we bet when you and I are right, when this guy is an absolute fucking bust? What can we <laughs> bet? Like, I want to bet so much. I want to bet so much on Trey Lance being absolute shit, like I've said three years ago. Justin Fields is getting better. I did pick the Bears to uh, actually do better things this year. But these guys are never going to. Steve Kim, we had a question for you. Justin Fields, more 100-yard rushing games or more 300-yard passing games this year? Uh, This year, I will still go with 100-yard rushing games. I still don't like their help outside. I I will say this. When you rush that effectively as a quarterback, if you can pass for about 250, that's pretty good. I mean, look, Lamar Jackson is a, is a really, really good, effective pro quarterback. He's never really thrown close to 4,000. So if you have that ability to extend drives as a quarterback four or five times a game with an eight-yard run on third and six, you get a four-yard run on third and two, or control the clock a little bit, you can be an effective quarterback. But generally, in my view, what I want out of an NFL quarterback, I want a baseline of 4,000 yards passing in today's game. That makes you solid, right? Now, if you're in the 3,000s, you better be able to do something with your legs. That That is not an option or a luxury. That becomes almost mandatory. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that one. Uh, interesting. Interesting you have that take. Um, have you heard the news? I know you're not listening to basketball too much right now, but have you heard the news of – Kyrie saying LeBron needs to come to Dallas. Yeah, we we talked about that with Whitlock. Um, Kyrie is one of those guys. I am never listening to him. And and like I told Jason yesterday, because here's the problem. This guy could lobby for anybody. Say, this is going to work. And then one day he's going to wake up and say, hey, I'm more than an athlete. And the environment's been bothering me. And I believe we have to plant more trees. And I don't feel good. So basketball is just a game. And I'd be like, you mother, we did all. No. So I, I, Kyrie, I respect some of your stances. Congratulations on not getting the poison inside your body. You hope you live a long, healthy life. But when it comes to everything else, you are not the general manager. You're not the guy I listen to. Mm. Hey, have you heard about the Live Golf? I just been with Pat. I'm going to be with Pat this weekend again. I'm texting him live as this thing breaks. We're talking. Uh, he's, he said he wished he could jump on the show live right now. He has to wait till tomorrow the next day when it's official. The, it, the Live and the PGA have merged. Breaking news. That is something so big that uh, Pat thought it was bullshit. He thought it was it's so big because they're in court mediation. Tiger Woods McElroy have a lawsuit pending against them uh, from the Live. Saudi group has basically created the largest hypocritical group ever, the PGA Tour, has had to succumb to the money and the finance that they just could not hang with the Saudis, man. Well, my only reaction is is now golf is back to only one organization where I don't watch it. So you know, it doesn't really impact. I've never watched golf, never been into it. Uh, I've never gotten the fascination with Tiger Woods. 
Um, it actually used to bother me a little bit when people say best athlete in the world and they say Tiger Woods and I say time out. I better get a T.O. He's the best golfer in the world. Four round <laughs> fighters are better athletes than Aaron Golfer. No disrespect to anybody. Um, I'm not saying boxers can go out there and hit 300 foot bombs on driving ranges, but no golfer can go into a boxing gym and actually work a heavy bag properly. So let's <laughs> golf. <laughs> I don't watch. We'll never watch. Don't care. Hey, did this- you see LeBron James swing a golf club yesterday? He looked so bad. That That's, again, my proof. I've seen Kobe hit a golf ball, and he looks like he could swing a golf ball. Athletes are athletes. LeBron is a stiff. He's a straight line freak. So you really believe that LeBron James is not the athlete Tiger Woods is? You're, that's what that's what you're telling me. No, no, really? no, 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 no. Okay, so let's I, let, I, let, no, let, not, let not, not I mean, give me a break with that. No, one. not at all. What I'm saying is, like, when you look at the greatest athletes of all time, in my opinion, Jordan, great golfer, can play, throw a football. He can get on the bench press. He can fucking shoot pool. He can bowl. Like the greatest athletes, in my opinion, can do all things. And if you can't swing a golf club naturally, in my opinion, I'm I'm looking down at you a little bit, a little bit. I don't know. I, I play all sports. Like just because you're great in one, I mean you're gonna be great in every single sport. I, th- I feel like there's always. I, I, you know, I'm not saying be great in every sport. I'm saying athletically, you should look good doing it all. I hear you. And it's Steve, see, Steve, I want to ask you this because I feel like, I feel like this is a separate. This is a good discussion. How do you define? Like what what in, what athletic is? Cause I yeah. find there's different ways to define it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, because look, as far as I, if you say who's the greatest athlete, I say, okay, who's the Olympic gold medal decathlete? Right, right. And, and if you look at athletic prowess and the ability to do things with your body, which are athletic movements, gymnasts are the greatest athletes, right? Right. By that sense, or is it the actual ability to master one game, or or in JB's case, can you be all around and play several sports? And do the Jim Thorpe. So it's a really, it's an interesting question when people say, who's the world's greatest athlete? My question would be, well, by what definition? Mm. Can a NASCAR right. driver be the best athlete in the world? No. No. I mean, <laughs> hey, the best- is a NASCAR driver an athlete? Yes, I guess. We I had guess. a great debate about this uh, I had, with Tyoka Jackson on the show. He brought that topic up we had a seven minute debate about it and it was very interesting that the, the the chat was split he don't believe they're athletes at all he thinks the car is the athlete like the horse is the athlete and i'm like mm. i don't know dude i think that i've heard that when you get out of a car race 500 laps your body is like unbelievably yeah, I mean, up. there's a physical toll to driving i mean when i when i make my trips to las vegas and i drive more or less now you feel a little bit different. And now you're doing it at 200 miles per hour. You can literally die at any time, flip over 18 times. You have to be very, very wary. Your cl- your cat, your both legs are moving with clutch and gas and brake, right? So your calves, I heard, is, are unbelievably I mean, there, I mean, but then you have the aspect of skill. They asked John Cruck, really good hitter throughout his career, career 300 hitter for the Padres and Phillies, and I think White Sox. And they once asked him something about uh, – how athletic are you? And he goes, I'm not an athlete. I'm a baseball player. Because mm. the way he made the major league is he was really good with his hands. He got the barrel of the bat uh, on the ball consistent. I play baseball. And that's that, I think that's one of the hardest things to do, especially when you face a guy that could throw above 87 to 88, because that's when it gets really difficult. And if, if a guy can start changing speeds and he throws breaking stuff and he can spot it, it's the most difficult thing to do. But John Crook, Probably ran like a 5940, probably never lifted anything more than 12 ounces at a time in his right hand, right? In happy hour. But he knew how to hit the baseball and he had a really good career. Now you can get an NFL wide receiver that's an unbelievable athlete. They run four three. They can do all the shuttle drills. They can probably bench press 300 pounds. I think most guys, if they've never played baseball and you put them into a batter's box, and you even if you get a pitching machine to just throw fastballs out at 80. 80, which is very hittable, even now for me, they would be afraid of the ball because they're not I used am. to it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, Baseball I, agree. I, got, I got something. What, what is your take about with this? RG3. Oh, God. Here's the thing <laughs> with RG3. And we've talked about this, JB. 
Everything he says and does for social media is to get people off of his back for marrying a Becky Beckington. Like, everything he does is for pander. So he's got to stay on code after he's completely off code. And then, like, I, then, I mean, he looks so silly. I'm glad you called him out when he wore the DeMar Hamlin jersey backwards on air during that whole thing. And you flat out say, hey, bro, you look like a fucking fool. And he did. And he mad at me, he responded. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, and, and, wait a minute. This guy's literally dying, and you're using him for clout. Mm. What are you doing? Let's just be very honest about it. If you want to be respectful of the guy's health, wear a nice suit, pull your pants up, tuck your shirt in, and report the news. But to wear his jersey backwards, Give me a break. You're trying it was to a fucking clown show that day. I, mean, I thought it, it was is. horrible. I thought it was horrible. I, I got to get into my top ten before Smitty asks you this. I got this uh, th- this horrible fucking take right here, in my opinion. But this is being broken, and Steve and I always do a top ten. This is coming off of Bleacher Report, I believe. They have Kobe and Shaq at nine and ten. Shaq responded by laughing at them two both at nine and ten. Um, listen, horrible list. That's a bad, that's a tough mm. list to crack. It is, but Tim Duncan would be out of it for me. Um, best player of his generation. Boy, that's a tough statement. No, he's you. not. Stop no, it. You never had what was Kobe right Bryant about the game. Never had a losing season. See, make uh, sure the Spurs were okay during his descent. What that, that's what basketball is about. Steve, stop. Tim Duncan I, I, played the right way. Steve, stop. I, stop. I don't know. That's a tough one, man. Where, where would you put – let's not even talk about Kobe. Where would Shaq be if 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 he saw this list and he's number 10? Do you keep Shaq there? Are you are you okay with Shaq? Shaq wouldn't be above Akeem Olajuwon for me. He would be He would be above him? No. Oh, he would Akeem Olajuwon would be in my top 10 over Shaq. Mm. I think Olajuwon, at his level, when he was at his best, he played – center as well as anyone i've ever seen i didn't get to see the exact prime of kareem um i think kareem is still the best big man ever but in terms of what i was able to see for a very long time at his peak akeem olajuwon is the best two-way five i've ever seen uh he had more elements to his game and defensively he could guard the rim like nobody else he could play the high screen role he, he could guard jump shooters if he switched off and block shots like he did with john starks uh, his ability to hedge the high screen roll and to recover towards the basket for his size is unbelievable. And then his post game is the most ballet looking thing I've ever seen in my life. He had moves upon moves, what he did to David Robinson in 95. And this is a stat that is so underrated. And I saw something, a video a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was a documentary from a guy named Joseph Vincent of Board Films. He does unbelievable work. I could watch his stuff all day. Do you know the Dream is the only player ever to win back-to-back NBA World Championships without having a single all-star teammate? Mm. Think about that. He took a bunch of role players who were good NBA players, Otis Thorpe, Kenny Smith, an older version of Drexler in the second year. Robert Orr. A very volatile Vernon Maxwell, right? Bob Orr was on those teams, young Sam Cassell. But if you watch those two years without Jordan or a year and a half, the, the, the game that Olajuwon played where they ran the offense through the post and he was the point center and the stuff he did, I actually think Olajuwon makes an argument for being top six or seven and he'd be above Shaq. In fact, that's the one guy Shaq respects out of all the big men is the dream. Hey, how about how about, how about the, the fact, though, that, that uh, Kenny Smith said that he believes they would have beat a Jordan team? Okay, so that team, the Clutch City Rockets, in those years, actually had a winning record against the Bulls. They did. They actually matched up very difficult, and Jordan has said the big five, the big Nigerian was an issue. Mm. The difference is, though, again, they were in different conferences, so you could win a game here and a game there, sweep a third. You're only playing them twice. Now, what if a team now has a week and a half to prepare for a seven-game series? It was damn near impossible from 1991 to about 98 when Jordan played a full year to beat them in a seven-game stretch. It never happened. When hey, he played if, a full if, year. If, if Miami beats Denver in this series, which I'm calling, um, is it the most 
improbable. We had this debate yesterday. Victory of all time. I I think the Hey, by the way, someone said they would have beat your so great Bulls if they played too, Steve. Yeah, you know what's funny, though? It never actually happened. By the way, Elijah One was in all those years. Never happened. In fact, uh, they never actually made the finals outside the two years. So, yeah, the actual facts say, Rob, you're full of shit. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> I, I, I love these guys who speculate on stuff that happened and they said they would have. No, they didn't. They actually didn't. Yeah, it's probable. I mean, I'll t- just get, I'm kind of crazy. I will take the team with the six rings o- over the team that kind of won just two. I, I, but that's just me, though. Keep maybe going. I'm tripping. Maybe I'm tripping. Yeah, you know? maybe, maybe I don't know. I'm, I'm Asian. Maybe math is my thing. But six over two and also sustained greatness. I don't, I don't know. I'm kind of crazy. Like, I'm such an asshole. <laughs> yeah. You got to answer JV's question, though, real quick. Yeah. If the Heat win. I, see, to me, I put the most probable upset, the 04 Pistons beating the Lakers that had all these all Amer- all these uh, MVPs and All-Stars. But was on. it really an upset? If, if you, look, as soon as Malone it, went out. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. I mean, Chauncey Billups was a really good player. Rashid Wallace, incredible talent. Ben, ben Wallace. Wallace, defensive enforcer, right? And the late, Brand. Yeah, uh, Tayshaun Prince, who did. I I thought Tayshaun did as good a job of getting in front of Kobe as any player I've, I've seen. Long, long. Because he, can he move understood one thing: you got to get your ego out. And the one thing Tayshaun did was, I'm never going to try to block a shot of Kobe. I'm never going to try to steal the ball. I'm going to get in his way and try to get in his face. And they had a great defensive game plan. And Larry Brown showed his greatness as a coach. By the way, guys, I thought about you guys over the weekend on NBA TV. They showed a documentary on the 2001 Sixers called Everything But the Chip about Allen Iverson and really oh, Larry I Brown. Watch it. I got to watch it. And that whole team. And, I again, like I told you, Allen Iverson, I give him a lot of credit. And I think he can help young kids because he said, I look back and I said, you know what? I should have been more coachable. I should have listened to this kid. This is the greatest coach I've ever had. I was lucky to have him. Mm. And there was this one game. This And I brought this up to Whitlock yesterday about how every NBA playoff series now is a game of adjustments. One game will not really necessarily foreshadow another. And Allen Iverson, after this one game that they played, I think it was against Toronto when him and Vince Carter were just dueling, like 40-point games, rotating. Vince Carter had this look on his face like, okay, I'm going to be great. But Iverson has like this 50-point game where he had this bounce-back game. And Iverson gets up to the press conference and he says, I just want to say one thing. Larry Brown did the greatest job of coaching I've ever seen. The stuff he did for me in terms of making adjustments, I've never seen anything like it. And Allen had this realization, like this neurotic guy that changes jobs every five months. I'm lucky to have him. You guys should really watch that because I didn't realize that team won like every award that year except the NBA title. They won sixth man of the year. I think they had the defensive player of the year. Uh, Larry Brown was the coach of the year, and of course, AI was the MVP. Mm. Wow, yeah, I definitely yep, got to yeah. that out, man. I mean, AI, a- yeah. you know, I don't, I don't think legend. people are calling this Denver team like top 10 already. I go, stop, time? you're no. great. Oh, god, I'm I'm cool. are great. okay, god, no. I don't, I, w- I wouldn't go that far, I wouldn't go that far, but I do feel like if the Heat wins this finals. I do think, like, I mean, all finals don't weigh the same. You know what I'm saying? I do think this would have to be, at least in the in the conversation, I'm like, top, I don't know what. Well, Darnell, let me ask you something. It, it, no, in their no. lead up to the Western Conference Championship, did they beat a bunch of 40-ish win teams? No, you're right. Yeah, I think they, I mean, beat, so. the, they beat the Timberwolves. They beat um, they, Phoenix. They, the Phoenix, which is a good team, but Devin Booker and KD only had like 16 games together. Right, and, and the they, Lakers. They the Lakers. Right. So, it's yeah, not exactly I, I, murderer's I, row. That's true. But they were a number one seed, though, pretty much all year. Yeah, I mean, got to respect that. Jokic is the nucleus. They got to get Murray back on track. But it's a good team. But when you're saying top 10 teams of all time. Nah, I don't agree with that at all. I don't agree with that. But if an AFC wins the finals, though. That's that's the side I'm leaning more. I'm leaning on the Heat side. I think if the if they were to go on to win this championship, do you guys think that this goes down as 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 one of the the greatest runs of all time? I mean, n- none of us expected the Heat, the eighth seed, to go out here and be in this position. If we're being honest, none of us thought at the beginning of the playoffs, all oh, the Miami Heat would be in the finals. So they've been proving us wrong all playoff long. I wonder how many teams have been able, if they do it, to win a Larry O'Brien, 
with this many undrafted free agent guys. Mm. I mean, it's not like you have a bunch of lottery guys. Right. And then, then Tyler, we don't need another hero. Uh, he's sitting out. So Malibu's most wanted. Yeah. So I, it's interesting. Look, playoff series are games of adjustments. Game two, if I'm Mike Malone, if I'm watching film in front of my team, I, I am harping defensively on their rotations and their switch offs. I thought they played one of the poorest defensive games, um, especially in terms of defending the perimeter. Um, and, and these were very, very like fundamental things in terms of just communicating. And you just look. Another thing is a pet peeve of mine. I've never seen so many three point shots where guys foul. Guys, just put your hand up in the face. Right. It, it, it's, that's the worst foul you can make, to be honest. The old with Shane you. Battier rule. Remember, he used to put his hand right, right. in Kobe's face like this? Yeah. And Kobe still would drill him, by the way, Steve. Just throw it out there. Um, <laughs> Wait, shot him off. Jesus. I'm just throwing it out there. I, I don't know. You know, that's just me. Um, just letting you know. Just letting you know, Steve. <laughs> yeah, just you know. Uh, I don't know. Hey, let's get into some boxing. I got. I know Smitty has some questions uh, about uh, Javante Davis. Yeah, like, what's, can you give us this, the the four one one? What's going on with, well, with Javante Davis right now? Yeah, Javante Davis. His summer plans have been disrupted. Uh, he's not going to make the barbecue. He's not going to make the pool party. Look, I think he got off relatively light, but money talks and legal situations like this. And I thought it was a completely bad move for him making phone calls and talking about the judge being crazy. Look, he may already be a marked man. Um, and with that said, he committed a pretty horrific crime. Hit and run, uh, you know, fleeing the scene of a crime, stuff like that, driving under the influence. And if you were to tell me the most I would get is a couple of months at a one-apartment uh, one bedroom apartment of my trainer, Calvin Ford, I would take it. Uh, now, again, everyone's going to point the finger at the lawyer or the system. You know what? I, I look, Javante is a, 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 a very good little fighter, very powerful, very skillful. He's had some issues, to say the least. I hope he learns from this. I don't know if he will, to be honest with you, because you look at the track record, uh, it's fairly alarming. At a certain point, there has to be growth. And keep this in mind, guys. He's not in his early 20s. He's about 28 now. But he's now going to have to serve 90 days. I don't know if you'd call that hard time. But it, it is what it is. I, but, you know, when you get house arrest after committing a crime of that sort, you should count your blessings if they're not sending you up for hard time. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. I, hey, I shout agree. out to three knockdown rule. Uh, it is on YouTube right now. Steve Kim, Mario Lopez. Uh, everyone's been on this show's been watching it. They love it. Uh, we all love it. It's been great. Um, yeah, new episodes coming out today on YouTube. Uh, subscribe and like, and also all the other podcast platforms. Thank you everyone out there for watching and listening. Hell yeah, it's 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 informative as hell. You uh, the last the last show you guys did, you had uh, what's the name on uh, the OG. Well, we had we've had Tessa Tor on, and this week we had Bob Arum on. Mm. And by the way, guys, uh, last week we talked about it, Darnell. How Ryan Garcia and Oscar, I told you that there was trouble in paradise. Yeah. And those two guys, literally that day on Thursday night, started sniping at each other because Ryan Garcia kept complaining about the the weight clause, the rehide. Yeah. By the way, Ryan, you negotiated all that, wouldn't let Golden Boy do their job. So what happened was, guys, Ryan earlier that week. So you're on your you. side on this spat on social media? Absolutely. Look, I don't think Oscar's perfect by any stretch, but when you are a fighter and your your lawyer negotiates terms that are disadvantageous to you physically, and then you try to use that excuse along with, well, you know, my, Oscar didn't show up to the press conference. Homie, you lost already. It, it's not like if Oscar would have shown up to the press conference, they would say, you know what? Oscar showed up. You know what? Ryan won the fight. He is now <laughs> trying to scapegoat. Um, a situation that had nothing to do with the actual result of the fight. Ryan, here's the facts. You decided not to take a tune-up fight in January. That's on you. You decided to only work at Joe Goosen's gym three days a week. That's on you. You're the one who did the uh, catch weight. That was not to your advantage. You're the one who agreed to the rehydration. You're the one who decided to fight the way you did. All of that said, yes, Oscar should have shown up to the press conference because he's the captain of the ship. That is his job. However, to bring that up as a reason why you are now disgruntled, 
I think it's cheap. And, and Ryan, to me, is incredibly entitled. And Golden Boy has enabled this, and they've created this monster that I now call Ryan Stein, that they cannot mm. control. But when it's all said and done, the fight was won or lost because of you and nobody else. I, I got yeah. an interesting take on this, though. Like, when you go to public forums, which social media is the largest public forum ever, are you basically saying, fuck you, this is a done deal? Because wouldn't you call him privately and say, hey, man, why don't you shut the fuck up? Or well, look, when here, you go public forum on it, doesn't that mean it's over? It kind of does, and I think I know what's going on here. They're trying to escape from Golden Boy, trying to create further division within that relationship. But look, Golden Boy wanted to schedule a meeting with Ryan Garcia early last week on Tuesday. They didn't do it. They didn't communicate. And then when Ryan does another interview, basically trying to cast blame on Oscar. Look, Oscar's a human. I don't disagree, Coach. I don't think Oscar should have gone out in public and tweeted the way he did. Now, for my sake and my enjoyment, I'm glad he did. I mean, <laughs> right. I, I am. I love it when people do it. So I'm glad they didn't keep it in-house. But quite frankly, Ryan can be petulant and a brat. Okay? Let's just call that for what it is. And Oscar is human. And I think there came a point where he said, you know what, kid? Let's lay this out on the line. And Because he actually said it. You're the one who negotiated all this with your lawyer, Lupe Valencia. Stop crying and bitching and moaning. But I, I love the way Oscar, his last tweet on the issue, he said, yeah, but I don't want to take this out on a public forum. Let's just come inside and talk. And I was like, okay. Oh, okay, Oscar. It's a little too late for that, Oscar. Like that, you know? It's kind of it's kind of like when, when someone says, Listen, I'm not trying, I'm not trying to offend you, but, but yeah, that's like after dropping the bomb on Hiroshima saying, you know, I, we don't want to do anything uh, catastrophic. We don't want to see a lot of people die here. You know, then you drop Nagasaki's bomb. I just uh, Oscar's great. Huh. Hey, what's your take on this? Uh, Netflix, you love documentaries. I know you love the 30 for 30 style of show. Uh, Netflix released, uh, or they're releasing a documentary called Swap Kings. Have you seen anything about this? Have you no, but look, I'm glad. I hope it's true that they're doing it, and I hope they're honest. I think it's one of the most fascinating runs ever. And look at the personalities. Tebow to the Pounceys to Aaron Hernandez to Percy Harvin. Uh, I remember when uh, Urban Meyer was hired by Florida in 2005. I said to all my Miami friends, I said, we're in trouble. And they said, really? I go, yeah, they have a real coach, and we got Coker. I go, that's like going into a fight with two arms tied behind your back. And it's funny, Zach Smith, our buddy, has said, oh, we knew. We had old Bowden and an incompetent Coker. We we're going to dominate the state. Hey, really? And I, and when I saw the first year, Urban Meyer actually, went, I think, went six and six. They struggled a little bit. Like but, Carol SC year one, yeah. Right, but but by their second year, I said, unless we get rid of Coker and get some real leadership, Florida's going to dominate the state. And it was an unbelievable run. Um, I will say one thing about Tim Tebow. I remember when he made that speech in his senior or junior year. They lost to Old Miss at home. Yeah. Big upset. And he read that speech. I will be the most dedicated. <laughs> Everyone laughed at him, especially all the Miami fans, because we're NFL. And I said, you know what? We should praise that young guy because he actually gives a shit. No, he and does. I, and, I, and I said, and I've said this to my, my Miami friends. I said, you know, we laughed at Tebow. I didn't because I said, you know what? We need that time. We had too many guys looking ahead to Sundays and Mondays who didn't care about Saturdays. And we also, we also pray. Your similar speech last year was the, the Williams kid for Detroit, the running back. Um, right. You have to have right. guys. You know, I'm, the thing that got me was, look. You can say what you want about Tim Tebow as a pro quarterback. Square peg, round hole is never going to work. I mean, his passing motion is like Charles Barkley's golf swing. It's just terrible to look at, but funny. But I, I surmise Tim Tebow is one of the three or four greatest quarterbacks at the college level ever. I think him and Tommy Frazier, in terms of winning and leadership and what they did for that within that system, I could interchange them. But when you are a leader of a, a team, especially college, and you lead guys to championships. The reality is most of these guys will not play professional football for long or at all. But when they have that ring, they're going to look at Tim Tebow a little bit differently. So you could say that guy is corny. He's a phony. He's a fraud. He does that fake leadership. All I know is this. He meant every word. And Florida was better off because they had a guy like him 
heading that program? Uh, who? Julio Coolio Jones in the in the chat. Great name, by the way. Coolio died, by the way. Um, I got I got to give you. I got to give you this. He said that we need more Kirby Smart speeches. I, yeah, no shit. That too. Need we, and he needs coaching. You don't know about Kirby Smart. By the way, Steve, please let these people know that you've been around Miami. You've been around all these different football. Yeah. That's normal football talk. It like, is. Look, at the end of the day, look. Today. There's an old thing in life: hard men make good times. And if you don't have hard men, you're going to have soft leadership. You're going to have bad times. I've kind of screwed that up. I'm just telling you, hard men do great things. That's yeah. the way the country was born, and that's the and game of soft football. Soft asses create hard heads, too. Kirby hard Smart, head, make a soft ass. Kirby Smart is an old-school coach. And if you actually watch their spring game, I watched a little bit. You know what I love about them? They hit. They mm. actually hit a lot. And they have guys like Blake Bowers, who's going to be a future top-five pick. He's out there playing ball. I mean, they run a physical. Now, you can do that when you line up three deep in top 300 players and five stars and parade all Americans. But I love the fact that Georgia actually has as much as you can in old school mentality. We're going to be vicious, violent and physical. We're going to teach it. We're going to preach it. We're going to play it even in a spring game. Because I, I watched a lot of spring games, even Miami. By the second half, it becomes flag football. I'm like, what are we even doing here? And if you want to be a physical, hard-nosed team, it's a mindset. It just can't start 15 minutes before a game where a coach says, hey, guys, we're going to be physical. Uh, if you have not preached that since winter conditioning through spring ball to the first day of fall camp, you're not going to be physical. You cannot turn it on like a water faucet. It does not work that way. That, that's, that, that actually goes for life. Like I'm reading a book about Jimmy Johnson, uh, his, his years with the D Dolphins. Paul me had with Miami – is that he had an older team with a quarterback he could not get rid of, but and what the players could not really adjust to, Jimmy put them in full pads the whole year. Mm. He said, bullshit, we're not doing shells come October or November. We're oh, you mean hit. before they had air-conditioned helmets? Air oh, my God. You know, there's a funny story about Jimmy. When Jimmy was at Miami, they tried to put, like, a practice field tent to shade the sun, and Jimmy got out there, and he goes, what the fuck is that? He goes, well, yeah, you know, coach, to make it a little cooler. And he said, do you think when we play at the Orange Bowl, there's going to be a tent blocking? He goes, put that. He literally said, you either take that stuff down or we're getting the f out of here. You got to make football tough. Football's a tough game. It's not for everybody. If you're not willing to play it, I absolutely understand. I get it because it's a violent sport. But you have to be able to embrace that violence. And Kirby Smart, that guy is the one guy out of the Saban tree that has worked. Because you know why? Because he's actually done it his way while incorporating, I think, many of the foundations that he's learned. That's real, man. Yeah. That, that's uh, real. I don't know who this is. William McClancy says, hey, Monica, he spent over 5000 on an app that boosts followers. Apparently, he's saying that I bought followers on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all know JB, man, if y'all think that. <laughs> I, I wish I would buy a motherfucking follower. I, hey, Smitty, how many times I delete? You know how many motherfuckers I block? You know how many – Bots I have. Do you know I've lost 600 followers in the two days, I, I was told? And by the way, guys, when you yeah. buy followers, it actually hurts you with the social media platforms. Hey, it's by the way, Steve, when you buy followers, which I just found out about that you can do, and I'm like, I wish a motherfucker would buy a follower. I wish I would buy anything fake. But let me, let me tell you, do you know how easy it is to notice who buys followers and who don't? You see the likes don't marry up with right. the followers. It's not very hard to figure out if you have you bought people. And I've been seeing this shit on YouTube and I'm I'm hearing if you buy followers or whatever they call them, they will they will literally ban you for life. Yeah, and the other thing is if you're trying to get sponsors and you're doing a pitch, you don't think those companies study your likes and your engagements. So let's say you say hey, I have 1.3 million followers on whatever, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. And so the company's like, wow, that's a lot. But they see you do a post. You post a clip of your show and it gets 12 views and three likes. They're going to be like, uh-uh. <laughs> Something smells here. Right, right. Something I, rotten I, in Denmark. I, I just did a whole, I had a whole meeting yesterday with a company and I'm sitting there like, that's exactly what they broke down. They're like, we know who's fake and who's not just simply off interaction. And I'm like, no shit. He goes, you get your interactions off the chart. 
uh, you should actually have many more followers because you don't promote it on social media. Like, cause, cause I don't have no team, Steve. Fuck, it's me and fucking the slapdick dog sitting here fucking jacking each other off on Twitter. You think I'm going to buy a fucking troll ass account? Like, hit them. And the burner account, Steve, kills me. The burner account thing is comical to me. Um, because I'm like, why would I need a burner? I actually say exactly what the fuck I would say on any fake account. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of people are going to hide behind the second or alternate account. I, I, you know, that's just something to me. I, that kind of breaks the code. You know? Hey, Steve I, don't, Steve, I don't know if you know this. Jeff Nadu, who you know, we've, he comes on the show. He's coming in the show right now. I don't know if you've heard the drama or seen anything about what's going on with Dave Portnoy and Barstool, but they basically came out and kind of drugged uh, our boy Jeff threw the mud yesterday on a video. Um, hmm. I don't know if you've seen this or not, but have you seen this? Breaking news, maybe not breaking news. The wild, tumultuous career of Jeff Nadeau is over at Barstool. He's out. Yeah, but so it's new news. So why? I, if I saw it, for his. I'll explain it. So Nadeau, when we let him back in, after he begged because he quit, he signed a two-year deal. We activate. We say, hey, we're going to go year two. And I think we give him about a $10,000 raise. He says, I expected my contract to be doubled. Oh, he wanted, oh, no. He wanted to go from whatever he was making. I think he wanted two hundred grand a year. Dude, and dude. I, I, this is, I'm supposed to go on his podcast. I'm like, what? you signed a contract. This is what I said. This is when I found out. I go, put everything on pause. I heard we have contract issues. The way I see it is if you want to not fulfill your contract, I'll let you out of it. You'll be dead to me in Barstool forever. Or you honor your contract and we revisit your contract at the end like I do with every employee, never mind ones who have received 3,000 chances and don't come into the office. Gaz sent me today, just before this thing, he said, Nadu out. Uh, here's what Nadu sent him. For me, it's only business. I enjoyed my time at Barcel. Appreciate the opportunities. I feel like what I have is proper. And for me, I think going on my own is the best. Uh, I also look at the fit. Don't think the sit down. It was there. It sucks, but I recognize it. You're always in my corner. I'm gracious of you. Yeah, for Jeff, me, keep it up. What's up? What's up? I mean, you can only, you're only hearing one side of the story, you know, I mean, you know, there's always three sides to every story, right? That's the thing about all this. First of all, I didn't beg it for anything. Second of all, I'm not, you know, we'll get into it, but there's always another side to the story. Steve, how are you, my friend? You all I'm right? doing well, Jeff. Jeff, I think there's an underlying issue, though, with, with Barstool. Uh, Dave Portnoy sold his company, which means he's no longer the king. Correct. And there's a price to pay for everything. I, I actually think moving forward, that uh, we are a content, we're all content creators here at different levels. Okay. We all have different aspirations. My goal is this. I always want to own my stuff. I, I do understand if there's a great opportunity, I'd have to think about it. But, Jeff, I do wonder if Dave, because I think he went through the thing with a guy that was fired a couple weeks ago that he did not want fired. I think it was a, a cold slap in the face like, Dave, you're no longer in charge of the thing you created. And that is priceless. You could pay me a million dollars. But if I'm making millions, I don't know if my life would be perceptively better if I go from 50 million to 200 million. I really don't, but that's just me. I don't own five yachts, you know? Yeah. Well said. Uh, man, Steve, I just wanted, I didn't know if you knew that, Steve, what was going on. So I wanted to get your take on it. Uh, and I, and Jeff was sitting in the back. I wanted to show the video, but I was just like, that's kind of crazy. I don't, Steve, you've been in, uh, you've worked at ESPN, you've been at these big corporations. Like, that's kind of similar to uh, Stephen A coming out and basically saying, "Hey, fuck Steve Kim, he left us." And but uh, like the, the professionalism just didn't sit well with you me. You know, well, it's interesting you bring up Stephen A. Smith. He's getting criticism now because he is actually coming out with certain viewpoints that would be considered <laughs> right of center. In other words, he's not bowing to the woke mob, and now there's hit pieces being sent on him. But that's why he did an extra podcast that was away from the ESPN Disney umbrella. Yeah. And now just the opposite, you look at uh, Pat McAfee. And again, I don't really watch him. I don't know if he has even started his show. But he's now going directly closer to the sun. And here's what's going to happen. Because we've already seen it happen with a couple of the co-workers like uh, Samantha Ponder and Sage Steele. They're going to say something that is not a part of the approved messaging and all the whiners, like, uh, you know, who they are, are going to come out 
and basically take shots at Pat McAfee. And Pat McAfee is going to have a decision to make. Do I stay true to who I am and my audience, or do I capitulate? That's going to be very fascinating to look at. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Um, I agree. Man, um, well, Steve, shit, we got to, we got to, we got to, I'll see you Thursday. We got to play some poker soon, man. Yeah, I'm we will. Get together. Together. When are you in Vegas again? Uh, I might be in Vegas. I, I got a hookup for the uh, NBA Summer League. Mm. Uh, they want me to go, and they got that big tall fellow that was a number one pick. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I can't believe I'm actually gonna be watching summer NBA league basketball. That boy's I'm, I'm gonna go. Blo- vlo- what are they vlog? Is it called vlog? You? I'm gonna vlog you the whole fucking time. <laughs> summer league's cool though. I love summer league. I watch summer league all the time. I, I would, I'd go, Steve. That's a good I, yeah, I might. Watch, I would watch two midgets fuck before <laughs> I go watch that. Wow. Okay. That's- but- can we see the two midgets? What yeah. <laughs> right, right. We, we need more contact. But Steve, hey, if you if you got a hook up on a Spencer Crawford fight, hit your boy well, up. Yeah, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty expensive ticket there, but Hey, Steve, it's actually going to be Kyler Murray and the little guy from uh, Jackass. Okay, well, here's the thing. If Kyler Murray, <laughs> Kyler Murray, I'll say this. If he was in a boxing match, everything he threw would miss. You'd stay on brand. <laughs> anyway, guys, Jeff, good luck with everything, bro. I can keep Thank watching, you, guys. See you guys later. I appreciate you. All right, man. Okay.